So let's start again. Uh, I'm Krzysztof Kosowski. <laughs> I introduced myself uh, already. Uh, so the presentation about the device tree bindings in the Linux kernel. I will shortly talk about the bindings. Uh, the expectation is that you know a bit about the device tree sources and the bindings. Uh, then the core will be about the new format of the Linux kernel bindings, so the DT schema. I will, the core presentation is do's and don'ts, so kind of tricks which will reduce the, my uh, review time, I mean my effort. So this is purely selfish presentation. I really hope that I will review less and faster of the submissions of people who want to have their bindings in the kernel. Uh, the talk finishes with reusable patterns, references, which I will not be here describing, uh, but I leave them in the presentation. Feel free to grab the PDF from the sket.org and use it in your work if you ever need some of these references. Okay, so uh, device tree bindings and device tree sources are used in many projects. This talk is focusing on the Linux kernel implementation. So there are some differences. I, this is from my point of view. Uh, I build this mostly on the reviews I received and also from the reviews which I saw uh, on mailing list. And this talk is kind of short, even now shorter because of the technical problems to which I apologize. Uh, therefore, if you send some patches, you might have a bit different, different review, then apologize. Sorry, I mean, the, the review on the mailing list supersedes, it's more important than what I say here. Okay, so the bindings in the device tree. Device tree sources, so DTS, is the way how we describe the, the hardware for the Linux kernel or for the other, several other projects. And the bindings are the ways, is the rule, how DTS should be constructed. It's also describe some kind of, uh, let's say, the, the interface, because it's used for several different projects. So it's not only Linux specific. It's not implementation specific. Mm. For the, all the time, we wrote the bindings in, a, in text format without any structured way. And the new way of describing the bindings is the DT schema, which is using the YAML as a language itself. It has uh, several benefits, this new format. One of the questions here was uh, because it allows us to validate the bindings and then against the core schema, meta schema. And it allows us to validate the device resources against the bindings, therefore to find whether the bindings are correct, of course, assuming that the bindings are correct. Uh, all new bindings should come in DT schema. Uh, you are still free to do some minor changes, like adding compatibles. However, adding new properties usually is not accepted, so you have to first make the work to convert the bindings from the text to the DT schema. This is the example. So on the left side, there is a, uh, on the left side, there is a, some device tree source. There's a SPI bus. This SPI bus has one ADC node. It has a compatible unit address, uh, rec, and uh, so the address on the bus, and has a regulator as supply. On the right side, there is a corresponding DT schema bindings. I removed some boilerplate code here. It's not important. Uh, we start with the title description, which describe the hardware. So this is some ADC, uh, analog digital ADC, something with temperature sensor. Uh, we have a list of properties. We expect three properties, the compatible, which should have some specific value, like that one. Uh, we expect one unit address, address on the bus, and we expect the supply, which is a regulator, which is optional. Why is optional? Because it's not mentioned in a list of required properties. Required is only compatible and uh, rec. Entire set finishes with additional properties false, which has a meaning that no other properties can appear here. I will also describe the meaning behind these additional properties later in the presentation. What are the generic rules for the bindings? Uh, we already have the document, so I will here briefly describe, say what we already have. Uh, hopefully, if you ever submit patch, then please read the document fully. Don't, uh, don't, read, don't rely only on my presentation. So the same as device resources, the bindings should focus on the hardware. DTS describes the hardware, the bindings describe DTS, therefore also it's a hardware, not an implementation, especially that the bindings might be used in different projects. The Linux kernel bindings are used in U-Boot, are sometimes used in OpenBSD, FreeBSD, I know, many, many, many places. 
for the same reason also we prefer not to use Linux specific subsystem naming in the bindings. There are a few, let's say, not hardware related like uh, like DefRec or XCon that are more uh, Linux specific. So avoid them. We want the bindings to be dual licensed, so GPL2 and BSD, for the same purpose of reusal in other projects. Uh, we want the file name to be based on the compatible, so usually the file should be named like like this vendor with a device or vendor with a sort IP. Pretty often your driver comes with a header, which is also part of the bindings. Therefore, you expect this also to be dual licensed. We like it to be also with specific file name. The bindings should not be mixed with the driver code. We expect it to be as a separate patch, preferably at the beginning of the patch set. So the driver code can be in the patch set, but uh, not in one patch, not in one commit. Yeah. Uh, more about the compatibles. So this is actually one of quite important properties of the device resource. Compatible, like many things in the binding, should be specific. What does it mean, the specific? First of all, we don't want any wildcards or family names are usually also thrown upon. So the family name might require that you have a uh, you have a specific other compatible in front of it. The bus suffixes for the compatibles also don't make much sense because the bus, what the div, it's kind of obvious from the node which is enclosing the device on what it is the bus is. Uh, Linux has two specific compatibles, syscon and simplemfd. I'm not sure if they are used in other projects. They have a meaning in the in the Linux and they are not specific enough, therefore they require a specific add-on. Usually they have to be prepended with a device specific compatible, like in here the Qualcomm for this. Simple MFD is very an another special compatible which has its own meaning that you can instantiate de uh, devices, children, for which they don't depend on any resources which you have. It's for really simple devices. So, for example, for for example, if you're uh, if you have some clocks or power domains, then it's not for the simple MFD. It's only for the cases when the devices don't rely on anything of the parent. Other rules. So we focus on the hardware. I actually mentioned it uh, before, but not exactly on the programming language of the uh, of the device. So typical example is if you have a voltage regulator and it has some minimum uh, voltage, then the property should be expressed in the logical units, which are microvolts, not in some enumerated values which map to the, to the voltages. Why? Because it's really much easier to read, these microvolts, and it's much more portable, for example, if you want to support another type of device, let's say from the same family, which has a bit different mapping of this one, two, three to some other voltages. So voltages are much more portable. Uh, the DT schema. So we have another doc explaining how to use it. So just I refer to it if you really want to try it. But actually it's very straightforward. So the DT schema is written in YAML, which is pretty nice, easygoing language. You start it with just, you have to install it with Python as a Python package, and then one comment, uh, make DT binding check, can test your bindings against the meta schema. You can limit which bindings should be tested. You can test all your DTBS against one binding file or several binding files, or even all of them. So this is the target. Uh, DTBS check. There's also a way to do test one DTB against one bindings or another com combination like that. Do's and don't. And this is the, I hope, the most useful part of this presentation, at least for me, because uh, this will uh, offload my review time. So this is the selfish part. Uh, the properties in the, in the bindings. So uh, pretty often you need some property and you pretty often you can find a standard property for it. Please use it. Don't inv reinvent the wheel. Uh, where to find them? Maybe you can find them in the device tree uh, schema repository itself, or for example, for the uh, GPO, GPIO, T 
typical consumer properties like reset GPIOs, enable GPIOs, we also have the uh, bindings which express them, or just look at the other common parts in other bindings everywhere around. You will still need custom property from time to time, and a custom property has its own requirements. So usually you need a vendor prefix for it, so this foo behind the comma. You need a type. I will also uh, speak about the type in a second. Type is expressed with a ref reference. And you need a description. So this is the total example how it would look like. So there is a Qualcomm prefix. There is uh, a type. This is assigned integer 32. And there's a description explaining what is this. This is in the case of number of samples. I said that you don't need types for certain cases. So the type which is this ref. You can skip it if you have a standard unit suffix. So the suffix means like in the property name, like this microvolt. There's a list of them. Here is the link if you ever need to check. Or where such properties are already described by the core schema or any other core schema. These are the examples. So the first one is entry latency US. US is from microseconds, therefore it's standard unit prefix. No need for type. Uh, two others is like a supply, which is also regulator. This is a pattern coming from the core schema. Again, no need for the, for the reference, for the type. The third one is interrupts as well defined by the core schema. It, has, it even lacks description, and I will also mention later why it lacks description, this interrupts part. So we are going to the arrays, like this interrupts. This is why quite common property. When you have clocks, uh, reg, power domains, interrupts, DMAs, IO elements. The main requirement for such properties are they are strictly ordered. So we have kind of a helper for them, which is like with the names. So clock names, interrupt names, uh, DMA names. Uh, therefore, the Linux implementation pretty often grabs such resource by the name. However, this is just a helper, and it does not remove the obligation that the, uh, the array is strictly ordered. If you use this kind of uh, helper, then make it specific and then don't add there any obvious suffixes, like if it's an interrupt, it's just TX interrupt, not TX IRQ. No point to add IRQ. And both of them, so the clock names and the clocks, interrupts, interrupt names, have to be strictly ordered and constrained, so by the size and by the order of that. That's actually obvious. How to make it the easiest way? Like that, so you define the clocks, with, uh, which is an array, an array with two items. This, the items are ordered one after another, so the order is fixed. The clock names come as well, and we expect specific names as these clock names. There are also other ways to define the arrays, so it depends on your case. This was one way. For some cases, uh, you don't need to define the minimum items. I mean, if you want have an array with, let's say, obvious items, then you can just skip the description of these items and say that you have max items too. If you just write max items too, means that min items, so the minimum number of items, is the same. The reset names in that case have to be explicitly mentioned and described. And this is the, uh, the case which I described before about the interrupts, the easiest if property is obvious, like rec, interrupts, just say max items one and be it. If there will be more items here, it's not the obvious case. Another typical property is syscon. So I mentioned before about the syscon compatible. Syscon compatible is a provider of a syscon, uh, of a syscon, let's say, which is the way to access the registers from other block. And syscon property is the way as a consumer of it. So there's a pretty often such syscon property, and syscon is not specific enough. It requires uh, something more. So it should be descriptive. It should have a vendor, it should have a proper name, and it should have a description. The example there, just syscon is wrong. Please go towards this direction. So other vendor prefix like Samsung, other sysrec is short from system register, so some kind of descriptive name and the description. There's also a better way to show it. So this is a bit more complex example where you, because syscon is a p-handle, so it's a kind of yeah, pointer to some other node. 
Uh, in that case, we use a p-handle array, and we define what type of items we, use, we expect in this array. So we expect only one item. However, this item is still an array, so it's an array inside an array. Uh, this item consists of two items. So one is the actual p-handle, and second is the uh, offset. And it follows with a description of entire property. So this is more complex way and more specific way to describe the syscon. I mentioned in the beginning that the uh, that your schema finishes with additional properties false. So additional properties and unevaluated properties are the way how do we control that how do we control uh, how the bindings see other properties. So the properties which are unexpected, how they will be handled. So usually in your case you will just use one of them and set it as false. So additional properties false or unrelated properties false. The simplest case would be looking exactly like this, which is pretty similar to the example from the beginning. Like you list the properties, you list which properties are required, and you finish with additional properties false. And if any other property appears here, which is not listed, you will have a warning and you will have an error. There is a bit more complex way let's say for other cases. So uh, pretty often we reference other bindings, other schema. The example shown on the screen uses the panel dash common. So it's on some panel driver and it references common panel properties. In that case, we still can use additional properties false and this will accept only the properties listed in, uh, uh, in this car, uh, particular schema. And other properties coming from the other, from this panel dash common, have to be explicitly mentioned as well. However, you don't have to describe the type, the constraints, the description from this other schema. You just have to say that it's accepted from the other one. And this is expressed with this backlight true and reset the GPIO is true. The description, the constraints come from the panel dash common. So the example looks like also finishes with additional properties false. And finally, we have unevaluated properties false. So this is for uh, cases when you want to take all of the properties from the other schema. So in that case, it's pretty common for regulator.yam. Regulator.yam Linux kernel has many, many properties, and you don't want to list which one are valid for your case or which are not. You just take all of them, like everything. Give me everything. In that case, the appropriate way is to use unevaluated properties false, and you don't have to describe anything different. So our first example with this panel dash common would look like this. So we have, we reference this panel dash common, we mention our properties specific to this device, and we don't have to mention, don't have to describe the backlight, reset GPLs, doesn't matter, because they will be coming from the panel dash common. When to use which one depends on your case. Uh, pretty often if you want to make it kind of extensible, then this unevaluated un properties force is better approach. But if you want to make it really constrained and uh, let's say you don't know or you don't want the other schema to, to be applied to you entirely, then you should use additional properties false. Depends. The stock is too short to describe all the cases. Bindings finish with the examples and we use these examples to validate the bindings themselves. Therefore, please provide always an example inside the bindings file and provide a useful example Usually one is enough, no point to provide 10 examples, especially if they differ only by the compatible. It just doesn't prove anything. Uh, the example uh, is intended with two or four spaces, which is a bit different than the Linux kernel sources, because everything in the Linux kernel sources is indented with a tab, so that's the difference. Preferred way is to use four spaces, because it aligns nicely with opening character, how this example starts with. So this is how it will look like. If you have an example, hopefully you have, uh, remove their status disabled, status okay. This is pretty common thing that people copy the, the code from device resources to the example. And this will be, of course, my, my complaint that please remove it. It's not uh, necessary in the example. If you create a binding for a provider, like a clock provider, a reset provider, so something which gives this kind of clocks to others, you can skip the entirely, please skip the 
examples for the consumers, because consumers are obvious. We have other examples of consumers. So just describe, give the example for the provider. How much time do we have? I think we still have some time. And the last thing actually is that uh, the device node names should be generic. So this is also a pretty common complaint from my side. The generic node names means that it should represent some kind of class of a device like an ADC, so analog digital converter, not AD71 something, something, something. That would be it. Uh, the presentation goes further. So there are several reusable patterns for you, so which I collected over the time. The patterns like uh, how to require one property in one variant, so one of compatibles but not in the other. Uh, how to exclude some properties, but one is required. How to exclude properties, but none of them are required. I will not go through them. Just grab the PDF and find them and enjoy. Also, some references here. Uh, and that would be it. Pretty fast session. Maybe you have some questions. Yeah? No, uh, there is no microphone, so... Uh, so your question was uh, whether the name of a node could have a prefix and whether there are some examples of these prefixes. Yeah, because for ADC, for instance, it, it looks simple, but sometimes it's not as easy to get the class of the device. At least you have always the same name. Yes, that's true. So uh, the answer for this would be, I linked here, uh, so device tree specification has an, uh, there's a link here if you click it. So it has a generic names recommendation. It has examples of the node names which you could use. And also, this could be a prefix for the name. And you had also a second question. Yeah, about the compatible. Uh, you were saying that you don't want the bus to appear in the compatible name. But that would make compatible seem identical across different devices. If we just use the stock name, for instance, we would have a vendor comma stock name for the spy bus, and same for the high quality bus, and same for the lost controller which is not very friendly from a user point of view. Um, so far, actually, every time I had to introduce a new compatible, I was always, I was sure that the, the type of device would be welcome in the compatible name. So I was a bit surprised. Uh, so your question, I'm repeating the question because the guys in the internet don't hear you. Uh, so the question uh, is that I ask not to put the type of the device in the, uh, in the compatible name, but actually you think that the the compatible should have some type of the de uh, device the name because it's useful for the people. So uh, maybe I was not specific enough. You should not put the, uh, the bus uh, on which this device is into the compatible. So for example, don't okay. say this SPI or I2C as that this device is on SPI bus or this device is on I2C bus. Okay. Uh, if it's an I2C controller, then I expect it's a, yeah, that it's NXP, IMX8, dash i square c something something okay thanks for the verification yeah. anyone uh, oh uh, great so we were i think first here <laughs> um, do you have advice or resources specifically with respect to graph binding because uh, sometimes i find that the uh, relationship between the devices in the board itself and the device tree bindings that exist on screen sometimes uh, i'm working with very strange hardware which i cannot seem to uh, map to the existing bindings. Mm -hmm. I have made some attempts in the past to rectify these bindings, but there seems to be a lot of booby traps there with respect to the graph binding. Do you have some good resource, or maybe I could be reading the advice tree specification again? I'm not sure. So the question was whether I have a good example for the graph bindings or the bindings using the graphs. Specifically with respect to, for instance, not just one to one, but one to many or many to one. Specifically about many. one to many. Yeah. Therefore, <laughs> unfortunately, answer is no. Uh, I can try to look and extend my presentation, or maybe this would be a reason to come here for the next year. Okay. Uh, but so far, I don't have. Okay, uh, anyone with the question? Back in there. Um, but to the extent the question about the uh, compatible name and the appended bus there, uh, how about the devices that can be connected in multiple buses? For example, I have about one hour ago, I was trying to find it up there, and I added it to the bus there. I didn't send it yet. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, this time it was accelerator, uh, accelerometer, as I was writing, and it, was, it, it can be connected either to the FCI or to the I squared D bus. And I was thinking that uh, by adding this, this suffix for the bus, it could inform the driver that um, because it needs to prove the correct driver there, that which which one it needs to be probing the D I squared D or the D or the, or the FCI device. So the question is, uh, you have a accelerometer who is on the can be on the I square C bus or SPI bus, and you actually think that adding the specific compatible for the bus would make sense in that case to help Linux to prop. So in the Linux, it actually doesn't matter because the device is already on a bus, so uh, you just use the same and compatible. And if it's enclosed in the I square C bus, then it will be uh, bound, it will be matched by the I square C bus stack. Therefore, you it cannot be instantiated as a SPI device inside I square C bus. Therefore, the same compatible can be used for the for the both cases. And there are only few cases which are exceptions, and uh, this is not the exception. <laughs> I hope this <laughs> answers the question. <laughs> Anyone else? I think so here I saw a uh, hand up. No. I think that one has ah. solved itself. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Yep. Yeah, one more there. I believe that Visual Studio Code has some nice plugins. Uh, otherwise, I don't know. So the question was whether there is a nice uh, viewer for the YAML files. So I would recommend Visual Studio Code. But I'm not expert in the editors. I still use VI, uh, VI so I'm <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, examples. So, I just teach, uh, well, this is very useful in my opinion. And if in the kernel documentation there were an extended uh, version of this with more examples of real use cases, like this device has either three or seven clocks, or it has, uh, you know, so strange cases with uh, the corresponding code, I would find it very useful to write proper bindings uh, if it were. So I'll be also a parrot for the Interim guys, so uh, it's not a question, it's a recommendation for me to add it to the Linux kernel. <laughs> yeah, a good idea actually, I'm thinking about this, uh, so thanks for the uh, for idea. Indeed, the documentation in the kernel could be improved for this. <laughs> Anything more? Yeah, please, here. So the case is about the uh, additional properties false when we re reference other schema. So I believe you ma you speak about this example, right? So this is for the case where the both two properties, so the backlight and the reset GPIOs, are already defined by other, either by a core schema or by the other one, so by the panel dash, uh, dash common. In that case, it's acceptable, it's perfectly fine, because the description, the type, everything comes from something else. No, um, setting additional properties to true. Additional properties to true. Yep. Yes, so this is uh, outside of the scope of this session. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is useful for a few cases, for reusable bindings, where you define a binding which will be referenced by the other. So probably, I don't know, but probably panel-common defines additional properties true. So this is the case where uh, you could use it. Uh, Brian? So the question is whether you should always use all of or whether you should not use it. When, when should I and shouldn't I use all of? Indeed, I could add it. This is a nice uh, typical case. Uh, so the answer, where to, when to use all of, when to don't use it, uh, use always because uh, the all of is a uh, syntax for referencing other schema or, for example, for uh, putting conditional. So if 
something than something. The example uh, using it will be, uh, I hope I have an example for this. True, so this if conditional could be enclosed in all of or not. Both cases would work for the YAML syntax. I would propose to use that one, so put it in all of. So I recommend always all. If you have conditional, always use all of. But then what would you put in all of? <laughs> okay, so that's the question. So what would you put in the all of? So the all of means that all of below conditions should be applied. And the condition can be, for example, other schema. So you want other bindings, like this ref. This was this example with panel dash common. So if you want to reference other schema to be applied here, you uh, include in the all of. If you have some if, then, else, or if, then, whatever, also put in the all of. Is this answering your question? Unevaluated properties. So you can, uh, you can, in the top level, you cannot reference other schema without all of. In the property name, in a property type, you could, and the property type, you don't use all of. Just copy the example schema and based on that. <laughs> 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 but thanks for the, for the question, quite tricky topic. Any more questions? Yeah, here. Uh, so the question is whether the DT binding check can look for this uh, do's and don'ts recommendations I mentioned here. Ooh, uh, patches are welcomed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I would be able to, to code it. I mean, it's quite tricky, but yeah, it's uh, the DT schema. So the tool which performs the validation of the bindings of all this stuff is written in Python. So it's pretty, let's say, many people know Python. Uh, yeah, but we always, uh, I think the Linux kernel uh, would benefit from people writing more tools than not necessarily the, the, the kernel code. So patches are welcome. Or pull, pull requests because it works also on the GitHub. So you can uh, mm -hmm. slide slight way. Yeah. Uh, this is just out of curiosity. Sometimes I see in the bindings a uh, list of compatibles which are suitable for a particular binding. And sometimes these compatibles, they are embedded in let's say different things. So you might have a, a list of items and then there will be some other construct. Now I, it escapes me what it looks like exactly, but I have always wondered why I don't just have a simple list of compatible things. Why is it split up into these different gambles as well? Uh, so the question is uh, when we see the list of compatible, sometimes it's just, an, for example, an enum or it's uh, items or one-off. So I don't think that I have a nice example to express it. And therefore, you have to believe me on on the yeah. I would have to open the some code. Uh, so the answer to this is depending what do you want to achieve. So the typical case is enum, which means like a enumerate. So list the compatibles which can be used independently. So either this or this or this or this, but not and or. It's like ex exclusive or actually so. In the other cases, you have a list of compatibles. So. Uh, like this compatible syscon or SuperMFD has to be followed by a device specific compatible. So you have a list of two, always two. And then therefore use items. And sometimes you have multiple combinations of it. And then you have to use one off and then describe, uh, specify what is this one off should be valid. What, what is the combination you expect? So items is a list. Enum is enumeration of, so just one from this enumeration, and one of is combination of few of these options into one uh, schema. I'm not sure if this and example. One of could contain subs, you know, so subs. Yes, okay. yes. And the question in the back. Yes, I have a question from a remote uh, member, Hector Palacios. We have uh, a platform uh, GTP contains many different nodes. How do you validate a full GTP agent, uh, a full GTP against uh, many different schemas? 
in parallel. <laughs> so how do you write, uh, evaluate many different uh, GTBs? Uh, the tool the make GTBs, I mean, you run the target make GTBs check, and it runs all possible schemas on all possible targets or all possible GTBs which are now compilable. And you can uh, restrict it if it's too much. So probably you will go to the beginning of the presentation to answer the, this question, which would be a lot of scrolling. Lucky my finger is used to clicking. So that's the example. And that's the, uh, the line here, makes make DTB as check. And you could skip the DT schema files. And then the check will be everything on everything. I mean, all the bindings on all the files. Question here? I think the question was, how do you match which schema is for which node ah. DTB? So the question was how to match which schema, which, uh, which uh, node from the DTB. Right. Yeah, in that case, uh, the matching, yeah, this probably this was the question. Uh, so the matching, do I have the example here? Ah, not really. So the matching is done by compatible. So a more complicated way is there is a keyword called select, and you can find such select in the bindings itself. If the select is missing, there is a kind of implicit select by the compatible. So the device tree schema tools are looking for the matching compatible, and when they find the matching compatible, then they, okay, they, so we apply this schema. If not, then we go forward. Any more questions? Great, so thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, I hope it was useful. The presentation is on online. And yeah, have a nice day.